This year's Highlights film will be presented without interruption as a courtesy of our sponsors, Twin City Federal and the Control Data Corporation. Now here is a name you would expect to see on a film like this. Twin City Federal. It has long been one of the biggest boosters of major league sports in this part of the country. Twin City Federal is also the leader in savings. Co-sponsoring our North Stars film are the folks at Control Data Corporation. Control Data is proud of its relationship with both the North Stars and the University of Minnesota athletic programs. Amateur or professional, champions or not, Control Data believes that these teams deserve the support and gratitude of our entire community. So sit back, relax, and enjoy yourself as we review the highlights of the 1974-75 Minnesota North Star season. Minnesota North Stars were a team in transition. Experience was supplanted by youth in a sweeping, rebuilding campaign. J.P. Parisi took on a new look in the colors of the New York Islanders and quickly discovered that old friendships end when hockey games begin. 
Along with Parisi, Jude Druin was also dispatched to the Islanders where mustaches seemed a part of the Long Island landscape. Veteran Fred Stanfield, number 17, shuffled off to Buffalo. He had played well as a North Star, but time was running out on his career. Barry Gibbs, an all-star defenseman with Minnesota, moved on to the Atlanta Flames. The influx of new faces who were to be the stars in the making included Doug Rombo, a lean and hungry center iceman. Craig Cameron returned to the North Stars from the Islanders along with winger Ernie Hickey. This trio replaced Parisi and Brewer. From Atlanta for Barry Gibbs came Dean Talifus and sturdy young defenseman Dwight Bialoas. Completing the trade for youth, Norm Graton came from Buffalo to replace Stanfield. The infusion of fresh talent would require leadership, and that was supplied by a nucleus of time-tested NHL pros. Among them was Dennis Hextall, who for the third consecutive season was the North Star's leading scorer with 74 points. Hextall's gritty, aggressive manner also made him the most penalized player on the squad, but this was representative of his style. Hex operated on the theory that it's more blessed to give than to receive. Hextall's roughhouse antics served as a prelude to one of the North Star's most picture-perfect goals. Lou Nanny much of the season and his heady, hard-checking play was missed. Nanny's versatility made him valuable both as a defenseman and a forward. The North Star's most valuable player was number eight, Bill Goldsworthy. Goldie led the team in goals for the second year in a row, scoring 37 times. Goldsworthy played hurt much of the year, but his competitive fire was never snuffed out. Maturity dictated a more sedate version of the Goldie Shuffle. A hero with the fans and the captain of the team, Bill Goldsworthy maintained continuity in the changing portrait of the North Stars. On defense, Tom Reed, number 20, played with determination and consistency. most flamboyant of all the North Star defenders was Dennis O'Brien. OB was the bruiser whose pugnacious play made him the star's most penalized defenseman. Whatever was necessary to get the job done, O'Brien would do. Dennis was another in a long line of walking wounded as the stars sustained an inordinate number of crippling injuries to key personnel. When healthy, O'Brien played with unbridled enthusiasm. Minnesota's most valuable defenseman was number three, Fred Barrett. Barrett's play was characterized by an insatiable appetite for contact. Defense was Freddie's game, 
and for his aggressions, he sometimes paid the price. But determination was the Barrett trademark, and it made him the leader of the North Star's Blue Line Corps. The last line of defense, the goalkeeper, was the domain of Cesar Maniago, the elder statesman of the North Star goalie. was an unselfish performer who taught by example and faced adversity with resolve. As the North Stars took the bold step of assuming a new identity, Maniago remained a stabilizing influence which held the team together. Up, number seven. Twenty-five. Nineteen. This is senior referee John McCauley, who comments on officiating in the NHL as we watch and listen to veteran Lloyd Gilmore in action. Well, of course, refereeing, you have to be in really top-flight conditioning, you know, because the amount of traveling that we have to do anywhere from 80 to 100,000 miles a year, if you're not in top-peak conditioning, you just can't do the job. I'd say we possibly skate four to five miles in the average game. You know, sometimes you might skate a little more, sometimes you might not skate as much. It just depends on the reaction, continuous action. Some nights you never stop for four or five, six minutes. And it's impossible for you to skate up and down that ice and not get tired. We do get tired, but we just have to have that quick recovery period. That's why peak conditioning is very, very important. It would be very difficult if you wanted to go out there and let's say call everything by the rule book. 21, trip! Well, the game would be four and a half hours long. We wouldn't be a spectator sport anymore. It'd just be like whistle happy referee out there they, people wouldn't come to see that now you know there's some fouls you have to call but we have what we call our marginal fouls or fringe fouls they're not you know where the man is half turned around maybe on the hold or a hook but the puck slides off right onto a teammate's stick well that's basically not uh, a penalty That's where the referee's judgment came out. A good referee. You can't stop the play. To be a good referee, you have to have good, solid judgment. Stay there. there. Come, Frankie. We're told, read the rule book, know the rule book, and then throw it away, because it's 99% judgment. Action. I saw it. I saw it. Action. Bubble come wrap, wrap around. I guess so. Yeah. Right. 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 score was 3-2, you'd see him going to hurry. What's the difference? Lots of difference, pal. You got a guy hurt, though. Well, do you think if you meant to hurt him, I'd give him a major penalty? <laughs> You'll learn the f***ing rules one day. Sure he was tripped. Yes, he was. Yeah. Face off out over there, sir. That's where we stopped the play. Did you trip good? Sure he tripped him. How the hell can we be short two men for five minutes? Well, five minutes for high stick. Basically, most coaches, you know, they get behind that bench, and some nights things aren't going too well, and they get a little frustrated, which is <laughs> natural. Everybody gets frustrated. What are you, nuts? What about the third man in the fight here? Oh, what about the third man? What do you matter? It's not an altercation. For sake. Open your eyes. No, you are good. You're on the from page two. Big shot, Gringo for every game he's in, he screws up. Nice game again, minor leaguer. Nice game again. Who are you talking to? Who are you talking to? It's a mind in the game. Close your ears. Bush Ligger. You see in refereeing some nights, you see a player will get a penalty and he may say something to the official. He may not say, well, he may say something or his teammates say something. And I guess after years, they should know that the referee will never, never change his mind. But they kind of say something just to maybe let out a little wind. The referee has to be kind of a, like a semi psychiatrist out there. He's got to know how to handle basically men. Sometimes when you know you see one get terribly, terribly emotional, you know, you have that 
other outlets you have the misconduct penalty you can use, but uh, that uh, sometimes can be overused. Let's say if he actually really gets too profane and makes a gesture or something that makes you look like a fool, you have no choice, but the actual few words he says it really doesn't bother anybody. Do you know why I save a Twin City Federal? Because with money growing at TCF, you can do the things you want to do. Man, that's thinking happy. Excuse me. And when you're thinking happy, anything's possible. But it's just a commercial. I'm Bob Lertzema. Yeah, yeah, and I'm Bronco Nagurski. Now come along quietly. Call the Vikings. Call my wife. Call TCF. Hockey is a sport. It is also entertainment. The North Stars, as members of the National Hockey League, face the premier hockey players of the world. But because of the unpredictable nature of the game, even the very best at times wind up going in circles. NHL hockey is sport at an accelerated pace. The action is wall-to-wall -wall and frequently violent. While league officials took a dim view of fighting, the fans loved it. And at the Met, they got their fill. of the North Stars was obvious in the youthful faces of the stars of the making. In terms of NHL experience, many were relative infants, but their battle cry of pablum power thundered through the Met. The sophisticated fan knew that the bubblegum line of today could become the siege gun line of tomorrow. For many, the apprenticeship process was painful, but the team had made a commitment to youth, and these were players who would put the North Stars back into the NHL playoffs.
The blending of the old and the new, the veteran alongside the rookie, found the North Stars developing a fresh esprit de corps and a new personnel to emerge. Seven, age 21, played in 52 games for the Stars and matured quickly into a smart, effective team player. Getting that first NHL goal happens only once in a player's career. Scoring against Chicago's Tony Esposito made Blake Dunlop's even more memorable. It was his first as a North Star, but it would certainly not be his last. Doug Hicks, number 24, age 19, was the North Star's youngest player. was Minnesota's number one draft pick in 1974 and his play justified the confidence of the scouts. <laughs> Dean Talifus, number 15, age 21, was a homegrown product from nearby Hastings and an All-American at the University of Wisconsin. Telephus was a big, long, striding skater cast in the image of Pete Mahovlich. He gave the stars size and savvy at right wing. The Marine-style haircut of John Flesh made him the North Star's resident hard hat, although he was only 21. Aggressive, slashing, bruising in style, his game was beating opponents to the puck. Predictable, but constantly hustling, Flesh played each game at the peak of emotional intensity. <laughs> Above all, there was no masking his enthusiasm. From the same mold as Flesh was number 18, Don Martineau, age 22, 6 feet, 190 pounds. He, too, had a rough-and-tumble style, plus an ability to capitalize on scoring opportunities. Martineau would not be intimidated by even the biggest names in the game, as he proved to Boston's Bobby Orr. Ernie Hickey was a wing who could fly, a winger who could stick handle, Hickey was the North Star's third leading scorer. Hickey collaborated with Dennis Hextall on a textbook example of a perfect goal. could score from anywhere on the ice to the delight of the fans. Over the second half of the season, he was one of the North Star's most productive scorers. In 59 games, Graton had 17 goals and 18 assists and quickly became a favorite of North Star patrons. The North Star's Rookie of them all was a home state product from Eveleth. This year's winner of the Rookie of the Year Award for the North Stars, a native Minnesotan, Peter Lepresti.
I'd like to thank my teammates for this award, uh, and I just hope that things continue in the same way and that we can uh, get into the playoffs next year. Thank you. Just 21 years old, Lopresti was the youngest goalie in the NHL. There is no position in hockey which exposes a player to more pressure than that of the goalie. Lopresti accepted this pressure with diligence and dedication. He learned under fire, and he learned well. Of the 32 skaters who wore the green and gold of the North Stars during the past season, 16 were rookies, and Lopresti was their leader. He had a 4.19 goals against average and was voted by the fans the winner of the Stargazer's most popular North Star Award. announced that former North Star captain Ted Harris would return to Minnesota as head coach. Harris would be joined by Andre Ballou, the first assistant coach in North Star history. Charlie Burns would assist Jack Gordon in the front office. And under the leadership of this group, the stars in the making could be swinging on a star called the Stanley Cup. been sponsored in part by Twin City Federal, the largest savings institution in this part of the country. More than a billion dollars strong, more than a half century of experience. And by the Control Data Corporation, a worldwide firm headquartered in Bloomington, Minnesota. enthusiasm evinced by number 18 Mike Eaves was symbolic of the fresh winning spirit displayed by the rising stars. Make him go for it back there. That's it. had supplied coach Glenn Sonmore with the ingredients of success, it remained for Sonmore to refine the skills of his individual athletes and to mold the disparate talents of his players into a cohesive winning team. exclaim that winning is born on defense. For the North Stars, veterans Paul Schmier, number six, and Fred Barrett, number three, provided a stabilizing force to the Blue Line Corps. Their efforts were supplemented by Brad Maxwell, number five. Greg Smith, number 23. Kurt Giles, number two. And by Minnesota's top draft choice, young vocal Craig Hartsburg. The stars subscribe to the old axiom that in gold, two heads are better than one. In Gilles Malache, number 27, and Gary Edwards, number 35, 
Minnesota was blessed with a pair of stingy netminders. Malosh's 27 victories were the most in a single season by a North Star goalie, while Edwards set a club record with an 11-game undefeated streak. Penalty killing is perhaps the least glamorous job in hockey. In Minnesota, this arduous task was elevated to an art form by a duo of former Golden Gophers, Tom Younghands, number 29, and Mike Polich, number 16. It was primarily through their efforts that the North Stars permitted the fewest power play goals in the team's history. For a penalty killer, the ultimate high is a shorthanded goal. An injury to Bobby Smith allowed Mike Eves the opportunity to showcase his talents in the NHL. And Eves made the most of it. Second effort characterized the style of number 11, Tom McCarthy. Playing on a variety of lines, still scored 31 goals, the most ever by a North Star center. Glenn Sharpley's emotional outburst augured good news for Minnesota. When the victorious United States Olympic hockey team was beaten by the rising stars, it served a purpose. It was a vital part of the learning process for the youthful Americans. Olympic coach Herb Brooks spoke in glowing terms about North Star rookie Steve Kristoff. Steve Kristoff was an outstanding member of the United States Olympic team. And now I know he'll be a quality player for the Minnesota North Stars organization. Help me, Stevie! Come on, go to skate, Steve! Go skate, what so did hockey and the Olympics do for Kristoff? Hockey has been a thrill all my life, and the desire for better competition has helped me all through my career. Playing on the Olympic team helped build my confidence. It made the transition to the North Stars a lot easier. In one year, Kristoff played on an NCAA championship team, the gold medal Olympic team, and in the Stanley Cup playoffs, hockey's supreme hat trick. An inordinate number of injuries cost the North Stars dearly, with Bobby Smith's broken ankle the most devastating blow. After missing 19 games, Smith returned to face the streaking Philadelphia Flyers. Go Flyers! You're going to beat the North Stars tonight! We just moved here from Philadelphia just several months ago, in September, and... Uh... My family is for the Flyers, but I've turned over to the North Stars, and I feel tonight is the night for the North Stars. They're going to break the Flyers' streak tonight. I think Bobby Smith's return is going to turn the season so the North Stars will be in the playoffs at the end of the season, and it's going to be all the way in 1980. The odds are going against Philadelphia because they've won 35 or haven't lost in 35 straight games. The odds are definitely with the North Stars tonight. We will do it. Guarantee it. An early flyer goal silenced the crowd. Philadelphia had gone 35 games without defeat, an NHL record. The Broad Street Bullies were at their intimidating best. But when Catfish got the fans involved, the tide turned abruptly. Mike Eve scored the equalizer. Less than a minute later, Greg Smith gave Minnesota the lead to the delight of the largest crowd in North Star history. Bobby Smith's breakaway was disallowed because of an offside infraction. But the breaks evened out when the Flyers were whistled for too many men on the ice. In the second period, Craig Hartsburg made it 4-1. The touch is coming back. 
In just 20 seconds, Zanussi and Polich collaborated for another goal. And the rising stars were raising the roof off the Met Sports Center. Ron Zanussi made this a night to remember for the North Stars and a nightmare for flyer goalie Phil Mir. Aside from its opening salvo, Philadelphia was firing blanks. Malosh was positively superb in goal, drawing the grudging admiration of flyer ace Bobby Clark. The coup de grace was administered by Bobby Smith. Undeniably, the flyer streak was magnificent, but its conclusion was even more so. Against the Toronto Maple Leafs, Al McAdam turned the net area into a red light district. The sturdy right winger absorbed a multitude of cheap shots from Daryl Sittler, but in...